there's a small tuition uh, of three dollars. Uh, Brown Bastard, our treasurer, will uh, will be around to collect the tuition from you all uh, if you haven't seen them already. Now, um, now, in addition to the three dollar tuition, uh, the restaurant. There's a minimum five dollar ch uh, charge from the restaurant just for uh, breathing the oxygen in here. Uh, if you, um, uh, whether you order anything to eat or not, so you might as well get something to eat. Uh, well, I should say five dollars plus tax. Now, now I'm just going to explain very briefly the format of the College of Complexes. Uh, we're going to have some announcements uh, first on upcoming events in the community, that kind of thing, uh, and then our speaker is going, uh, Tim is going to be speaking. Uh, now, we're on kind of a tight schedule because this Tim's uh, presentation is, is going to be fairly long. So we're going to try and wrap up. We need to wrap up the announcements by about 8.20 at the latest. Then uh, Tim's presentation will start. We're going to try to have to be over with that by about uh, 9.30. Let's have a warm round of applause for our speaker, Tim Bolton. All right. All right. This, uh, what the this phone, is going to be... The buttons, brother. It's going to be a very intensive, uh, oh, I'm lot of, lots, of, lots of video tonight, lots of um, audio, but I'm going to be covering a lot about coffee, including its history, brewing and brewing preparation, and a little bit about the fair trade certification and its trade. But as I said, we've got a lot of material to cover, and... Uh, so let's get started on the brew. Uh, the brew. There you have it. Anticipation. Now you might wonder a little bit about where coffee got its start. Possibly the cradle of mankind, the ancient land of Abyssinia, now called Ethiopia, is the birthplace of coffee. And uh, it all started with a goat herder by the name of Coffee or Cockley. Can you spell it? K A K L I. All right. And Cockley, you know, as as most Cockley goes, as most of those guys in Ethiopia, he had a goat herd. And with those goat herds that he had, you know, he had to do a lot of different uh, things. But one day he was calling his goats home and they wouldn't come home. And he was wondering, why did these goats come home? Well, it turned out they were in a field full of coffee trees and coffee beans, and they were eating those coffee trees and coffee beans. They, uh, because of the caffeinated things that the coffee beans provided, those goats did goat things. You know, they butted heads, they did more things that goats normally do, except in a highly exaggerated manner. <laughs> now, later, Calv Calv the shepherd brought his goats back to uh, back to um, the uh, goat, the, the herd, and the very next day, they went off to the same field. This happened for well over three days in a row. And Kalfi, the shepherd, said, after three days, tried this himself. And all of a sudden, he ate a few of those cherries, visions of poetry ran through his head. Now you may wonder a little bit more about what happened afterwards, but let's take a little bit here and see what goes on with the stuff. If you want some on.
testing.
few pennies on the blend cost. It's millions of dollars on the bottom line, and the consumers won't notice. Some well-known brands began adding more of the inexpensive Robusta coffee beans to their blends. There are two types of beans that are commercially grown. One is Robusta and one is Arabica. The Robusta coffee is the low-grade quality coffee that is found in instant coffee and in many ways the commercial coffee that America has been drinking for the past 50 years. And Americans did not know any better. Widely grown in Vietnam and parts of Africa, Robusta plants resist disease and are easier to grow. They contain much more caffeine than the higher priced Arabica beans, but produce a harsh, flat, and bitter brew. America was drinking swill. According to the Urban Dictionary, swill. Anybody care to give give me a quick definition of what swill is? It's uh, it comes from a pig We heard it. It's called God swill. God swill. No, come on. The swill. Swill comes from a pig Basically. The coffee that your parents drank was, according to some people in Starbucks and other some of the more of these premium coffee companies, pure swill. And uh, I don't think, according to the Urban Dictionary, it's a drink that's partially about the grade of your posterior, so to speak. But uh, as we uh, will see in a little bit more. The next part is going to be a little bit more about the rise of the solving of this problem of swill in the American things. I'm going to be basically giving you a little bit about Starbucks and a little bit about um, the rise of another coffee roaster. So I'll continue. Swill is from like a pig pen, ain't it? Swill comes from a pig pen. Right across the street. Insulin is then secreted by the body, causing sugar levels to return to normal. <coughs> Most health 
experts say moderate coffee consumption is safe. But excessive amounts can cause problems. Coffee is one of the lubricants of many industrialized world, and it's really the role that caffeine plays in stimulating our central nervous system and uh, making us speak more clearly, think more clearly, uh, improves our motor skills. It really lends itself to all of the activities that we normally undertake as part of an industrialized society. The majority of coffee consumers still buy the lower price cans of ground coffee at the supermarket. The sales of so-called specialty or gourmet coffees are growing. At the dollar value, this represents about half of coffee sales in the U.S. In 1960, overall per capita consumption of coffee in America was 15 and a half pounds annually. Today, it's only 57 percent of that, less than nine pounds annually. The reason the consumption declined in the United States is that the commercial blends began to undermine their quality by introducing more and more lower grades and particularly more and more robusta type coffee. And so the consumer uh, very predictably responded, predictably responded by... ...how one man found his calling and made a fortune. Most people have a cup of coffee, they don't think anything of it. You had a cup of coffee and it almost changed your life. A cup of coffee changed my life. need money As you can see, I can go past this part on Green Mountain Roasters for the amount of time that we are going through, but uh, I think you kind of get the idea of, uh, <coughs> our, of what, we, what coffee is and a little bit about its history. The next part I want to go into a little bit more is, uh, you know, things like the, the roasting and the process of, uh, you know, a little bit more. But I want to address another question first. Is all really well in this uh, corporate coffee environment? You know, according to some people, things need to change. I'm just going to show you a short clip from uh, a deep this disgruntled Starbucks employee. Here we go. Channel series called How It's Made. And it's going to just give you a brief overview of the brewing and the roasting process. Now, like I said, I know it's a lot of intensive video tonight, but it is covering a lot more ground than I can cover in a shorter amount of time. So here we go with the uh, brewing and the roasting process.
you guys hear it? Yes, yes. Okay. The empty bins have to buy from the trucks. Each bin produces about two kilos of coffee beans, enough to make about 200 cups of coffee.
pushing aside the foam at the surface to release the intense aromas, a technique known as breaking the cup. She smells each cup in turn, a sure way to know if something is wrong with the roast. Next, she skips the surface to remove the grounds. She takes a sip, slipping the coffee over her tongue to get the full flavor before spitting it out. Now she can determine how she will balance the blend of beans to create a recipe for the perfect cup of coffee. Back on the factory floor, the various beans for the blend go into a grinder. the desired grind, coarse, medium, or a fine espresso like this. Now the coffee is ready for packaging. It's a fully automated process thanks to this machine that forms, fills, and seals the bags. Gourmet coffee must go piping hot from the grinder to the bag to ensure freshness. As the machine seals each bag, it pumps in nitrogen to replace the oxygen that makes coffee stale. The machine separates the bags, and they fall onto a custom-designed conveyor belt that weighs each one as it passes through. <coughs> Over at the espresso machine, the barista demonstrates the technique required for a perfect espresso. She puts seven grams of ground coffee into the holder, taps it down firmly, then wedges it in place. The machine applies water pressure to extract the espresso. The distinctive foam is a sign this coffee is first rate. The barista also demonstrates how to use a French press or cafetiere. She adds boiling water to the coffee rounds, then pushes them down to the base. Again, she applies pressure manually this time to extract the coffee's aroma. century that it started and then you know it, it, it migrated itself to the Middle East you know in Yemen and then they were very closely guarded and the Muslims had that very, very, you know they had that had an exclusivity on that trade until a, one of the Europeans got a tree and then it went all over the rest of the world as you can see around the 17th century we were talking very briefly about you know how coffee was you know one of the kickstarters to the Industrial Revolution. We also got in a little bit about how much the uh, caffeine would, you know, use and why it's been so popular, how it, you know, gives you a little bit more in your adrenal glands. Finally, we covered, you know, the coffee bre bre brewing, roasting, and things. Basically, to summarize, what happens is this: the board, coffee plant out, you know, and they'll Robert, grow it in a, in a jungle. They'll pull the cherry off the coffee plant and then they'll have a machine or a person take the pit the cherry which means basically pull the seeds out of it then they'll take those seeds and wash them they'll take off that outer coating they'll wash them again then they'll take them weigh them and finally dry them out once they're dried they're transported to the roaster where they'll be roasted or literally cooked until such a point 
as to where they're transported. See, then ground up, put in through what we call the French press, a percolator, an automatic drip coffee maker, or various other sundry methods of using coffee. Now, I myself prefer the automatic drip coffee maker. I like it because it's a good little thing that, that's easy to use. You just simply take your coffee, you put it into a grinder. After it's ground up, you put a little filter in, run the cold water, and within about, you go, go do something else like shave or take a shower. By the time you're done, you have one of these. <laughs> now, I'm going to get now, or go ahead a little bit on the video because I do have a little bit more slide presentations on uh, some of the impact that coffee may have. <coughs> And because of the length of the video and the time we have here, I'm going to do what we call the uh, numbers. Okay? As you can see here, from 2006 to 2008, Folgers was still one of the largest uh, brands to be sold on a worldwide, you know, in, in, in a country basis, followed by Maxwell Spouse, Starbucks, and various other brands, including Hills Brothers. And as you can see, we move on even further to our next slide. This is where coffee is bought or consumed. Most of it's still consumed at the home. You know, at work, here's there, a meeting place like Starbucks or something else, and then while you're traveling, which basically includes in your mug of your car. As we proceed a little further, this is total consumption of coffee by age. As you can see, for some strange reason, as we get a little older, we tend to like our coffee a little bit more. And as the 60 plus age comes in, we do a, we drink tend to drink a lot more. Now, as we move even further down, you'll find that uh, these are basically sales and millions of dollars from various other companies: Dunkin' Donuts, McDonald's, Caribou Coffee, and Starbucks for 2007 sales. As you can see, our good old friends at Starbucks still way outperform the other brands. But what's really interesting is that you know what the really the largest coffee retailer in the world is and that sells the most cups of coffee? is actually Dunkin' Donuts. They actually sell a cup of coffee once every 30 seconds around the world. And the funny thing is, you know, your 7-Elevens or your convenience stores that you buy your stuff at, usually about one out of every $23 spent is spent at a convenience store. That's, that's including everything like your gas, your cigarettes, your coffee, whatever. But, you know, still, these are some incredible numbers. As we look a little bit even further, um, it should be turning, okay. This is a little bit now left of uh, the last bit. And it's going to get into some of the uh, fair trade coffee issues and some of the marketing of it. This is only about 10 or 15 minutes, so and then we'll go right from there into questions. And because the free traders came in, the price of coffee has declined worldwide from about 1989 to right around 2005. <coughs> therefore, making it a lot harder for your, right. your uh, low-wage low farmer problem. to make a living at it. Now, what this has basically done is, you know, <coughs> in, in efforts to try to boost the coffee prices up, they have fair trade coffee. Now, the rest of this video will contain, you know, things like certification 
and other I items and things along those lines as to what they are and what they can do. But again, because of the sound problems we are having, I think it might be a, just a good time to wrap up the speech, take some questions, and uh, I'll basically summarize. I hope you guys had a little bit of informative thing about you know what coffee is, a little bit about its history, a little bit about how it's produced, a little bit about you know the growing conditions. Now, if you guys are really interested in seeing some of these videos that I've been doing, you can find them online. If you Google like the History Channel, Modern Marvels, the episode called Coffee, uh, look at CNBC, the coffee addiction. This particular one is just you just put into the you put into the YouTube search engine, fair trade coffee. You'll find it, and there are a whole plethora of other things on the web that will more than educate you on this issue. But since this is a college, I'm going to try to cover at least one more thing on it, and. Uh, what is basically fair trade coffee? That is what what happened is because of the worldwide price decline, a lot of farmers weren't getting enough money to make a living at it. So you know, in many of the producers and roasters got together and said, "Hey, look, let's give these guys a fair price." Now there are four different ways that it's certified, but basically what we need to know is if you buy a fair trade coffee you know that farmer is going to get the, pro the price Allie, this is your that will allow money. him to make a living oh. and a reasonable profit. So I guess the funny thing about him. it, though, is, okay. is that coffee is prices haven't there? really gone down at the supermarket, even though the worldwide price has declined. <laughs> you know, as much as I like capitalism, sometimes it can really, when there's an oversupply, it can do it. You're learning, you're learning. Oh, <laughs> I'll close this speech. Plastic shirt. Did you actually know that coffee was blessed by the Pope? No, talk about that. Oh. Yeah. Oh, this Satan's brew is so delicious, it's a pity to let the infidels have exclusive use of it. No, we shall baptize it and truly call it a Christian beverage. Oh, All right. <laughs> Which that? the ending. <laughs> I'll have to uh, hook that up because I don't remember off the top of my head. It's on the video, but I think with the sound props we're having and the fact that I'm sure I'm going to get uh, roasted with questions tonight, it's probably time to uh, shut down the video and go live. And uh, let's welcome back Don for our moderation. Okay. All right. All right. I don't need a mic either. If you guys right. should speak all right. loud. All right. First of all, I just now now's the time for the question and answer session, so we're a little bit ahead of the game, which is good. That means we're going to have a full hour for questions instead of only 45 minutes. We also are going to have a full hour for the rebuttal period instead of the 45 minutes that we thought we were going to be restricted to. So uh, now I just want to remind everybody again that all questions must end with a question mark. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Frank, you have your hand up, so go ahead. I have uh, been one of no, the I was going to add them both up. of Tim Bolger. Uh, I'll give you a full 10 points. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Coming from you, that's a compliment. All right. Uh, uh, all right, Karina, you had your hand up. There's two types of coffee beans. Um, Robusto and Arabia. Arabica and Robusto. Arabica. And Arabica has a better flavor, but Robusto is more robust. Has anyone tried to hybrid? The, the two to get something that would number one be robust and number two also taste good. Actually, the robusta bean was a hybrid, was actually a derivative of the arabica bean, from what I understand. If you look at a book by Nick Mark Pendergrast called The History of Coffee and its impact upon America, the robusta bean has not been around that long. It was basically derived to grow in areas that couldn't grow the arabica bean. Now, I do know that uh, there, there is areas where they're starting to grow coffee like vines. You know, vines on a, on a thing where they're trying to get a better quality of bean or and trying to, you know, get different characteristics. But as far as I know, nobody has tried to crossbreed the robusta bean yeah, the these are Arabica bean. Yours. Though there is research. Pause. All right, uh, sir, Paul you had your hand up. Uh, yeah. No, please. 
What countries uh, supply yeah. us with most of our policy? What's the I breakdown? Know. Um, I can do that for you here with a chart. Um, I know, Ellie. But it's basically Brazil that's the largest for us. And I think it goes then to Colombia, most of Central America, and then a lot of Asia. But again, I don't have the relevant statistical breakdown right in front of me in a, in a chart. But you, if you go online, and maybe perhaps uh, somebody here could pull it up for us and get a definitive answer. I do know, I think it's in order, it's uh, Brazil, I think Colombia, Venezuela, and most, you know, most of your Central American countries, and then some of those countries out there. Remember, coffee only grows within like a, a, a 1,500 mile radius of the equator. So it's going to be anything in that area. Most of it's South America? Okay. Mostly South America, mostly, uh, and then it goes to Asia and then probably Hawaii. Okay, uh, did you? Yeah. Um, I had a question about the, um, the, the fair trade controversy. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to know if you had any Well, the thing is, is that what, what, like a lot of trade associations do, they know that a lot of their farmers are having a tough time, but they also want to provide a, an increase to what they're getting in the price of their coffee. So in order to specialize, what they do is they will make a little bit of a criterion involved. I'm not exactly, again, I'm not exactly sure what the criterion is. It would have been more reviewed in the video. There's basically four types, like they have a green certification, they have the fair trade certification. Basically, what you're going to see is that if you look behind each of the blends of brands, you know, there's like either a cooperative behind them or there's some kind of a um, different audit method they use for the trading of coffee. And again, if, I, I'll refer you again to the CNBC video, The Coffee Addiction. It'll get into that quite a bit. And there's also another one out uh, that will, will give you more information on it uh, from the... I think it's the Coffee Roasters Association that will give you a lot more. And believe me, folks, there's an association for everything. <laughs> Basically, though, when you buy fair trade at a store, you know that farmer's been tested and audited and getting a fair price for his coffee. Now, what you can do, though, is when you go find these particular labels, if you look at them on the web, there's going to be a whole breakdown of the criteria that the farmers oh, use. Yeah. Uh, what is involved in, in certifying these farmers? I don't know if they get, you know, talk about the price they get, but it is it is a good thing to see that some of this stuff's going on. Okay. All right, uh, Pat, you had a question. Yeah, uh, tea versus coffee. Uh, tea, uh, tea has caffeine. Coffee has caffeine. Tea has a variety of flavors. Coffee has a variety of flavors. Uh, aside from the fact that uh, you know we had an unpleasant incident with Great Britain. Uh, over a shipload of tea. Why is coffee so much uh, more popular in the United States and most other Western countries, with the exception of England, Ireland, and perhaps Australia? Uh, are there any practical reasons for this, uh, the way this went? Not really any practical reasons except for the fact that uh, after we had the tea party in Boston Harbor, it's what everybody was drinking in Europe at the time in the 1700s. And naturally, you try to emulate what the popular crowd does, everybody drinks coffee. And it's just kind of fortunate or unfortunate that the British Tea Company came in. Remember that coffee has had a long history. If we go back to its history, Lloyd's of London was founded in a coffee house. You know, uh, most of these associations were founded in London coffee houses. You know, even the Al-Qaeda and its plottings were done in coffee houses in Turkey of all places. So, you know, coffee has had a long and vigorous history of creating fervent and revolution. And if you and if you, and if you look at like something like Gene Sharp, where he's to wrote a recent recent political belief called Dictator from from Dictatorship to Democracy, where he outlines about hundred and ten different ways to not imply consent to the government. He says one of those things that helps the population rise is the drinking of coffee. It helps fervent political revolution. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Charlie, you had your hand up. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really concerned about Juan Valdez being certified, but why does a can of coffee cost 10 bucks and how much does Juan get? 
And how much of that cost is rooted on multinational corporations that are destroying the earth, probably? You're moving on. I, do they care at all about the land where they, or do they just exhaust it and go on? You know, Charlie, it, again, that's a good question. I don't really... Well, why would they certify wine? They the certified... The guy getting cheated? They certified Juan. There's some bureaucracy? No. Juan was certified because Just Juan... Poor. Poor. Juan Valdez was a trademark, by the way, that was in, in, invented by the Colombian Coffee Growers Association to uh, help promote the, the selling of Colombian blended coffee. And Juan Valdez was basically you know, picked up by a couple of the American brands to kind of differentiate himself from various coffees. And as you know, once market segmentation tries to start moving on, that means that the market's kind of saturated with, we've had enough coffee to go around to everybody. What you want now is to make more money on what you're trying to, to do. Juan Valdez is a good example of it. Now, I don't think coffee in and of itself is a very labor-intensive occupation. You know, you have to have people pick it. Uh, for example, there was some it, it, earlier in here, uh, parts I skipped, uh, they actually have to, you know, one tree of coffee produces about 10 pounds or per year. And each of those cherries are usually hand-picked. Now, there has been some attempts in Brazil for mechanization and more mechanization of harvesting practices and things. But then the roasting process, the pruning of the grapes, the you know, washing of the beans has all pretty much been taken over either by mechanical or electrical machines and roasters and has been going on since about the 20s. Uh, the American coffee companies have had basically a free ride through the 50s and 60s. They were able to degrade their blend, they were able to go into these plantations, but the thing is up until about the mid-1980s they had something called the coffee agreement, which basically meant that prices paid to farmers were at a certain level yeah. in order to keep them in existence. And then a whole bunch of free marketeers came in and didn't agree with it. So since about 1989 to about 2006, coffee prices have been declining in a rather rapid fashion. It was kind of funny to me that it didn't translate into the supermarket. And it was also, again, funny to me that these co coffee companies make these huge profits, but paying these farmer starvation wages, well, hopefully the certification movement starts to address the problem. Perhaps maybe, Charlie, we could unionize or something. Oh, you know, but that's, 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 that's oh, the The farmer needs credentials. A revolutionary. Just a minute. Hold on a Ma'am, do you have a question? Yeah, I, uh, what you're saying uh, makes me question what I heard, but what I heard was that the climate does not favor uh, production of coffee, that less is being produced, while more and more people want to drink coffee because of um, developing countries that have developed taste for it. So is there any danger of there not being enough coffee for all those that want to drink it? I, I don't think we're in danger of running out of coffee. You have to remember that coffee next to oil is the second most traded commodity in the world. It takes about four years for coffee trees to uh, become ripe and start producing grapes. So it's not like an overnight process. Say there's a shortage of coffee, everybody and his brother is going to start planting coffee trees. So within about a four year period, you're going to see an overabundance of supply again. Four years is what it takes for, for a mature tree from seedling to be in a field before it starts using and ripening in production. Okay. And all right. Um, all right. Dave Zucker, do you have a question? Yes, I had two. Uh, first of all, they tell me that Turkish coffee is very different from what Americans are used to drinking, and then it's almost a paste. How did that gets? How did that wind up branching off as a different kind of coffee beverage? And do how did coffee drinking get to Ireland? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Americans. <laughs> All right. I think you just stumped me, David. Okay, okay. Can I, can you I answer just the question? stumped me. I don't want to. Okay. Go can ahead. I answer the question about Turkish coffee? Yeah. Okay. I've 
been to Middle Eastern restaurants, and I've had what, if I remember correctly, they call Turkish coffee, which I usually have after I finished eating. They say, you know, they come up, a waiter, come, waiter or waitress comes up and asks if we would like some coffee. They say, yes, they bring out, and that stuff is. I, I tell you what, that compared to, to to American coffee, which is just like black water. That stuff Swill. Is, yeah, that stuff is thick as peanut butter, <laughs> and, and and it gives you and you get this little tiny little tiny cup, which if I remember correctly is called a demitasse, but that stuff is that stuff is way more potent than uh, than than Folgers or you know Mountain Grown. Okay, let's uh, okay. Who else got a question? Oh, Rhonda, you had your hand up. Yes. Okay, what can you tell us about decaffeinated coffee? Decaffeinated coffee basically is. Again, I would have gotten into the whole process of decaffeinated coffee, but basically what they do with that is it's a little bit more complicated than just roasting the beans. What they basically do is they take the beans from the coffee plant and then they run them through some industrial solvents, uh, whether it be you know, water or some other chemicals, to remove the caffeine. And then they take the beans and go through the roasting process and then the other process to, to decaffeinate them. You're basically still getting coffee, but without the caffeine. What they're trying to do now is to get rid of the caffeine without getting rid of the oils or the essential uh, other things that move along there. And there's been a lot of recent advances in, in freeze-dried decaffeinated coffee, too. They found that um, they have found that the traditional methods where they would, you know, get an instant coffee Weren't, weren't working as well, you know, just removing the caffeine and then free and then uh, doing it. And around the 60s, I think it was Hills Brothers that came up with mm -hmm. the freeze drying process. That basically they would freeze it, they would dry it out, and then they would, you know, grind it up, pack it in nitrogen, and there you had it. And as far as instant coffees are concerned, Nescafe is still the largest brand in the world. 80% of coffee that is drinking overseas is Nescafe, and I think you might be able to attest to that because you've been in Middle Eastern countries. I've never been in the Middle East. Oh. I went to a Middle Eastern restaurant. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. All right, um, okay, now Karina, you had a question before, so before I go to round two of the questions, ah, Doug, go ahead. Yeah, um, since uh, Starbucks made such a bad move in uh, buying those coffee futures and having the price go down, you think it's time to short their stock now? I wouldn't short Starbucks stock right now. <laughs> the reason why I wouldn't short Starbucks stock is because they have, as a company, downsized significantly since 2005 by closing of their stores and by laying off people. And as you can see, the disgruntled employees said they made enough profit to give every employee about $8,000. I would recommend them maybe not so much as a buy, but maybe it's more if you have it, hold it for a little while. If you are really wanting to and do some investing and you really wanted to make money in investing, I would start looking at something like uh, perhaps to some of the solar energy companies that are you know, using that very technology to help mechanize the coffee fields going in. There was, a, like I said, again, I'll refer you to that CNBC documentary, The Coffee Addiction. It'll talk a lot about it. Starbucks has been a stable company with stable stock, but it's, it's, a buy. It would, it's a good place to hold cash, but that would be about it. Okay. You won't lose it. All right. Well, since Charlie and Karina have their hands up, but before we go to round two, I just want to ask if there's anybody else who has a question who has not already uh, asked a question. No? Oh, oh Janet, go Janet. ahead. Uh, how much coffee do you think that you consume in the future? Well, I think if we, if, we, if we look at the video up there, um, the average American... You want me to take it, Allie? I think it was about 57 pounds of coffee. Do you think they more or less? Would that be part of their problem? What do you mean, now? Uh, all the cups. Yeah, they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, you know, they do too much or too little. Uh, I, I think that a good, I think it, at Wrigley Field, it, it's not so much coffee that's consumed, but it's a beer. <laughs> you know, and, and the fans have been in this mass delusion of 
of of keeping these cups going for a long time by the beer that they've been drinking. They're sort of like in this uh, fog, much like I am myself being a diehard. But what they what the cubs need, I think, is like what happened with coffee. They need to industrialize and move up. Perhaps maybe now changing their management around did some good. After all, it was another Epstein that brought the Beatles to America. And look what happened to them. Okay, Paul. On the subject you just brought up, do you think maybe if they served coffee in the Cubs dugout, it might wake up the team? <laughs> I would have to concur. <laughs> okay. They need all the help they all can right. get. All right, now, is anybody from? Go ahead. Yes, I'd like to know the relationship between sugar and coffee. Yeah. Doesn't uh, the uh, coffee consumption stimulate the sugar consumption? And what does that affect uh, on uh, the physiognomy? I think you just stumped me, Brown. <laughs> you just stumped me. All I can tell you is that it's good with cream and sugar. <laughs> and it works ah, real it's well. good for the dairy industry. Too. Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, you know, both, both are stimulants. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. With coffee, because caffeine is a stronger stimulant than sugar. Yes. Both have, 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 have. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I have read that you should drink coffee, and uh, even more so if you have sugar with it, that it uh, it gives it raises your uh, insulin level or your sugar level, and, and uh, the insulin goes into your response by flowing into your system and and then you have a sudden drop so you uh, really should eat at the same time rather than just the sugar you should have some like carbohydrates or something else along like uh, with the, otherwise you uh, would just uh, end up getting uh, the shakes and, and then you, 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 you probably will eat more eventually than, than you anticipated if you're thinking of having a diet and losing weight. Okay, um, okay, uh, sir, uh, you had a question. Yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, companies like Starbucks, they're bringing a, what, what appears to me a simple product to market, a cup of coffee or a cup of espresso. Uh, that bar chart that you, that you showed was kind of dramatic for me because it showed Starbucks Hugely, uh, I don't know what criteria you were measuring there, or what that bar chart was measuring. Sales and stars, uh, but it looked like ten times the volume of the next competitor. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you have uh, any idea what 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 Starbucks doing right that its competitors are not to have such a huge financial so advantage. More than McDonald's. I think. Well, I still. You got to remember that. You know, McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts are still selling a lot more coffee than Starbucks is. Oh, I didn't know that. All right. You know, as I said before, Dunkin' Donuts is still the world's largest uh, seller of coffee, with um, being about 30, every cup of coffee every 30 seconds. But for in-store visits and... But that's not very impressive, one every 30 seconds. Are you right on that fact? Yes, uh, I can verify it. Again, it can be verified. I'm just saying that isn't very impressive. I mean, one, one cup every 30 right. seconds, that's, that's still... GM makes a car Remember the city of Chicago that's impressive, but worldwide? No, it doesn't strike me as that. Sorry, sorry. No, no, I, I understand. But like I said, I, I might be subject to clarification on it. But as I said, you know, when it comes to the coffee shop itself, you, you, have, to, you have to remember that Starbucks was the first one that was doing it on a sustainable basis nationwide. So then naturally, and they went, went into a very vigorous expansion mode where, where they had as many stores as they could cram into an area that would sell coffee. And even then... <coughs> Uh, there was room for competitors. All right. Um, all right, I see some other. Uh, Bob, you had a question. Uh, I couldn't hear the video at all, but did you talk about how coffee is the beverage that changed the world? Did you talk about that? A little bit more about it. I think what, what I was trying to do with uh, the beverage that was changing the world was, you know, just going into its history, as it was saying before, about how it, you know, impacted you know, from this little goat herder in Ethiopia with this gentleman, you know, munching on his beans from about the 6th century to today where this...
beverage basically runs and is the grease for the Industrial Revolution and even now the Information Revolution and that coffee is basically one of those uh, beverages that, you know, ferments revolution and uh, basically causes... I'm going to try to see if I can find a quote in here because there was something... Uh, I have here the first chapter of a book called The... Called the Uncommon Grounds, A History of Coffee and How It Changed the World. And there is a quote in here about, if I can find it here real quick, that will give you a little bit about uh, the French historian Michelet described the advent of coffee as the auspicious revolution of the times, the great event which created new customs and even modified human temperament. Certainly coffee lessened the intake of alcohol, while the cafes provided a wonderful intellectual stew that ultimately spawned the French Revolution. The coffee houses of continental Europe were egalitarian meeting places where, as a food writer, Margaret Vesser notes, they <coughs> could, without impropriety, consort as they had never done before. They could meet in public places and talk. That okay. sounds to me like a beverage is changing the world, doesn't yeah. it, to you? Yeah. Okay, oh. all right. Uh, okay, uh, Joe, did you have a question before? I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, do you recall a, a coffee bean process that uses the digestive system of an animal? Yes, that's, uh, I kept that out of the thing, but that's probably the most expensive coffee in the world. What, what it is, they have a certain animal that they eat the coffee bean, and when it comes out of her rectum in the form of, of stuff, they take that bean, wash it off, and they, you know, literally grind it. And I think it's like about four hundred dollars a pound Ew. right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 All right. Four hundred dollars. All right. Is anybody else who has a question who has not already asked a question? Ah, uh, sir. Why is vending machine coffee so horrible? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably because it's um, been brewed one cup at a time. Now there is a company out there that, huh? I thought one cup at a time. It can be, but again, it's how it's brewed and how it's made. You know, a vending machine coffee. If you're going there, it's probably done through automatic drip. It's probably an instant blend that's being used in there, and not a lot of extra machinery that's going on in there. Now there is a company called Green Mountain Roasters that's perfecting the art of one brew at a time. I didn't. Again, it was on this video here, but. It uh, wasn't as, uh, how shall we say, as, as good. Now, I like I said, vending machine coffee is usually a blend of like Nescafe or some other type where they just heat the water, put the grounds in, and then it, it comes out because you can't wait a minute or two minutes for a good freshly brewed drip coffee to work. It's usually an instantaneous thing that you want to use and uh, get your caffeine stimulant gone and drink. Okay. Um, all right. I have a question for Tim on that subject. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, what is it? What's this Green Mountain? What's the name of the company? Green Mountain Roasters, they call it. Okay. Okay. My question: First of all, is this a fair trade company? And second, are they headquartered in Vermont? I think they're headquartered in Vermont. Okay. And second of all, I don't know if they're a fair trade company or not. I okay. just know that uh, what I've learned about Green Mountain Roasters was that they are the epitome of what we call vertical integration. They were able to get some coffee that they had in there, and then they were able to buy a machine that was able to produce one cup at a time, individually brewed. So they not only, they would sell the machine at cost, they would take that cup of coffee and charge maybe 20 times what it's normally worth. And you'd have to basically give them the, uh, they made their money on selling the individual servings of coffee that would go into their machines exclusively. Now what's going to happen to Green Mountain Roasters is that their packs are going to be coming up, I think next year, which is going to allow other companies to come in and uh, you know get, bring these individual samples into their machines. So it'll be interesting to see how the profitability of Green Mountain Roasters will go on. They've had it, they've had it on a gravy train because they've had the model of what we call vertical integration, and you see it all the time, especially like in. When you buy a computer printer, you basically buy it at cost at the electronics store, and then they get you on ink and toner. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Is there anybody else who has a question? Who has oh, man. Hi. Um, first, the, when we 
saw the chart for Starbucks. Uh huh. Um, I think sometimes when you go to Starbucks, your your one cup of coffee is really four cups of coffee. You know, like a vende, empty yeah. or whatever. So I think the measurement of coffee, if you were to say, what is a cup of coffee? Is it six ounces or eight ounces? And that might be where Starbucks is showing that higher number of coffee sales, mm -hmm. possibly. No. Normally, normally a cup is defined as eight ounces of coffee. And this I do know because I just read it at the Coffee Roasters Association mm -hmm. webpage today. A standard serving of coffee is an eight ounce <coughs> cup. And if you get a vente, I think it's what, two, three, four cups of coffee? Right, exactly. That's my point. That they're right. selling, you think it's not one cup, it's three or four cups. Right. So, you know, if they're selling four cups, but an individual serving, they can claim four cups, but again, right. it's corporate America. They want to make themselves look good, you know? All right, um, Bob Matter. Yeah, Tim, I just, I just wanted to give you a, uh, a correction. Okay. The statistics I'm reading. Uh, but, uh, Bob, I, this, okay, this is a... Uh, let, let him go. Okay, all right, I'll, we'll, we'll allow. Yeah, I, because I'm, I'm, I'm... Yeah, do you... <laughs> I, yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm subject to correction because I'm, I'm trying to wing a lot of this stuff. Okay, well, there's, uh, I read that there's 400 million cups of coffee consumed per day in the United States. Okay. There's 86,400 seconds in a day. So okay. that means every second, 4,629.63 cups of coffee are consumed. Okay. So it's almost 5,000 cups per second. Really? But Tim was talking about specifically. Oh, you're talking about Dunkin' Donuts sells one every 30 seconds? I believe it's true. Yeah. And that's, what, that's what I was, you know, that was from, uh, again, from a History Channel documentary. Um, if you could pull up the stats, I'd much appreciate it, Bob, and, and how much they do sell. All right. Now, uh, this place did say that the fancy drinks, yes. like the, the, the mocha lattes and all that stuff, uh, 30 million of those are sold every day. Okay. Out of that 400, uh, out of 400 million, or 30, or 30 I'm sorry, 30 million Americans per day drink one of those fancy cups of coffee. Okay. Oh, okay. 150 million uh, drink other drink the normal others. stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody else have a question? Uh, have a question. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. Anybody have a question who hasn't already asked a question? Go ahead. Go ahead. No? Okay, well, uh, Ellen, go ahead. Okay, what do you think about all these studies that have come out recently, um, though I don't know that they're double-blind or anything, about uh, positive health effects of coffee, that if you, like, if women drink more than two cups a day, it'll decrease the risk of stroke and just <coughs> all, all sorts, all of that stuff. What do you think about all that stuff? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, at the medical research has been saying that drinking three to four cups a day produces some health effects. It can reduce stroke. It can, you know, help you concentrate. And it basically the effects of caffeine, if done in moderation, can be be done with some health benefits. You think that I do know anti antioxidants. That there's a lot there. I didn't really delve into it that much, but I do know that if you look at the John Hopkins University website, there's a whole plethora of a study that was recently done on coffee itself and its health benefits. And it's generally been getting to be a generally accepted practice amongst doctors that coffee is not going to hurt you, but it may actually be a little bit of a problem. He told me guys that caffeine can't. Uh, the because like this, perhaps decaf might be better for you. Personally, I like coffee. Thank you. But I'll tell you a little bit of my story. I have so much of it sometimes that uh, I get a little bit of gas. A little bit of a, as we saw, old Charlie Chaplin here in the film tonight. That uh, I have to cut back on my moderation. I tried myself this week not to drink any coffee for about four days. Boy, was I sleeping like a lot. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Now, is there anybody else who has a question who has not already asked a question? No? All right. Well, we'll go into another round of questions. Uh, see, Karina, you got your hand up, so go ahead. Okay. Um, what do you do with the... Um, it, is there any attempt to make coffee cradle to cradle? What do you do with the waste product that comes from uh, making coffee? 
the, 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 the waste product from coffee that you're going to be seeing, there's virtually none except for like the grape husks that come off the beans. And that usually can be recycled or, or turned into juice or some other type of things. I really didn't see a lot of where it's at, but it, you know, being that it's fruit husks, I mean, it, it's, it's certainly organic, and it certainly can benefit fertilizer. It certainly can work the, work the world, you know, so it's not in, much in there. Now, where you do maybe find some more industrial-type waste is when you like using solvents for decaffeinating the coffee, things like this. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't really look much into it, you know, except for the fact that, um, you know, Organically grown coffee is better than, you know, the stuff that's done with a lot of fertilizers and things like this. And much like any other crop, um, coffee that's grown, you know, organically is definitely tastes a lot better than coffee that's, you know, under a lot of fertilizers and things like this. What about coffee grounds? Coffee grounds itself? It's good for your, your trees. You can put them in your yeah, tree. You can, trees. Sometimes they just turn a whole coffee grounds it's out good the for the grass the tree. Let it grow. All right. It's a good fertilizer. All right, ma'am, did you have a question? I just yes. said, no, I don't have a question. I have a very brief comment. Go ahead. Okay, well, you can, you know what you can do? Uh, make your comment during the rebuttal period. Okay, uh, cool. Just come up here. Okay, go ahead, Charlie. Jesus Christ. All right. <laughs> yes. Uh, Tim, uh, yes. In, I spoke here and found out that Many, if not all, of the cocoa beans used to make chocolate are harvested by children. Now, did the website of the Coffee Growers Association indicate at all if their beans were, in fact, largely harvested by children? Did they not talk about it? They didn't really talk about it too much, Charlie. <laughs> okay, and, and basically the cocoa industry and the coffee industry are, are like are, are the same in some sense, but also vastly different. Cocoa is not as readily traded as coffee. I think it's like the third or fourth most traded uh, commodity in the world. But I, you know, when when I was looking into this issue of fair trade and labor exploitation and other things that these large multinationals are doing, I think what appalled me more was how, you know, the you know, how they had disbanded the, the cooperative, you know, in the early 80s, guaranteeing a minimum of price support through international agreement, the fair traders breaking up and basically taking full advantage of these guys who were the small farmers. And then at the same time, not passing on the savings that they were seeing to the American consumer. I didn't really address the child labor issue, but there certainly was plenty of labor exploitation, middlemen greasing their pockets in a big way, and plenty of collusion amongst various companies that it would more than satisfy your bid to unionize some of these things. I tried to address that through maybe through fair trade, through other things, but coffee's an international trading commodity. And if you guys really want to make a big difference in how you want to see your workers treated or anything else, you just go to your supermarket and buy the fair trade coffee. Or buy the stuff that's certified that it's made this way, that it's here. Because it's through the dollars that you spend on the brands that you want to drink that really impacts the corporations. I, I, I can't say this enough. If you like, if you're willing to spend the money on your coffee to make sure that workers are treated fairly, then go out and get your fair trade coffee. If you want to support your major corporation like Starbucks because it's quick and convenient, then go support your major corporation like Starbucks. But what capitalists understand more than anything else is the bottom line, dollars, and what makes them go. They wouldn't exist if there wasn't a market niche. I'm not going to say that their practices are despicable and all this stuff, but I can tell you one thing. If they can get away with it, they will try it at some point. I'm getting more and more convinced of that myself. But a company doesn't exist unless there's a market for their product. And it doesn't exist 
without people buying that product. And if enough people get upset at the practices of it, they will change. You have heard about conflict-free diamonds, for example. You hear now about fair trade coffee. You know, that's what it's going to take. It's going to take each and every one of you making your buying decisions and say, hey, look, I really like what these guys are doing. I like the certification method. And this is why I'm going to go with So you think it's okay that guys that use children, no, and it's up to it's me? Okay. I don't think it's okay. I, I honestly think, Charlie, that um, like any company, uh, the way to remedy it, again, is, you know, we have to have regulation of certain things. Child labor is wrong. And it should be outlawed. And most every country in the world recognizes that it's wrong. Even, even in China, there there's now a recognition that you can't have child labor. There's still a few companies that do it, like Foxconn, which is the largest uh, maker of consumer electronics in the world. But, he, but when they find out that, it, that one of their people is underage, uh, they're required by law to give them the boot and go pay for the rest of their schooling. So they're getting a little bit more better at it. Now, Vietnam, other countries like that, they might not be as enforced so much. But we all know that child labor is wrong. And again, being an internationally uh, trading commodity, it, it's, it's done at the local level through local law enforcement. And the only way that we can really make an effective change, and the most effective way to make a change, is number one, to publicize the abuses, and number two, don't buy their products. That's usually a boycott or something. You don't have to consent to their treatment of that people. And again, I'm going to say this once and for all. When you think you're being victimized by these major corporate multinationals, you're implicitly giving them your consent when you buy their product. Now, I'm not saying it's the most effective way because there's boycotts, there's lawsuits, there's all kinds of ways to bring down uh, abusive corporate power. Still the most effective is competition. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Did anybody else have a question? Okay. Uh, Pat, you had your hand up. Yeah. Uh, uh, one quick three question. Okay. Uh, what was, what is the animal that you were talking about? And what is the company that sells that coffee that I may uh, exercise my rights as a consumer yes. to avoid that? <laughs> You stumped me, but I think if we can get a good Google connection in here, I can get your answer to your question. I think it was a cat. Now, the real question. You at least four times referred to coffee as being, you know, the motor fuel, as it were, of revolutions. Right. And yet, uh, the Irish, who historically have never needed any stimulus to revolution, uh, drink tea. And historically have drunk tea, just like our founding fathers uh, in 1776 didn't drink coffee, they drank tea fortified with hard cider and whiskey and everything else. They were probably lit at the time of the Declaration of Independence. It's a historical fact. Right, right. Okay. All right. Okay. So what? So what's your my question? My question is: uh, Is coffee really the the uh, driving force of uh, revolutions, or is simply any time like-minded people get together with a grievance? Isn't that more the driving force of revolution? What do you think people drink when they're trying to bring together a like-minded grievance? Yes. <laughs> What's the historical Samuel example? Adam, too? Why? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's an historical example of, of revolution of, of, of revolutionary coffee drinkers. Let's see if I can find one here from Uncommon Origins. No, no, no. It's the book is called Uncommon Grounds. Okay, when Kier Bang, the young governor of Mecca, discovered that satirical verses about him were emanating from the coffee houses. He determined that coffee, like wine, must be outlawed by the Koran and induced his religious, legal, and medical advisors to agree. Thus, in 1511, the coffee houses of Mecca were forcibly closed. That ban lasted only until the Cairo Sultan, a habitual coffee bar drinker, heard about it and reversed the edict. Other Arab rulers and religious leaders, however, also denounced coffee during the course of the 1500s. The Grand Vizier Kubri of Continental 
of Constantinople, for example, fearing sedition during a war, closed the city's coffee houses. Anyone he caught drinking coffee was soundly cudgeled. Offenders found him biting a second time were sewn into leather bags and thrown into the bosphorus. Even so, many continued to drink coffee in secret, and eventually the ban was withdrawn. All right, I just I need to make a real quick correction to the text you're reading off, Tim. The Grand Vizier of Constantinople was a Turk, not an Arab. Okay. All right, uh, but let's go on. Uh, Rhonda, you had a question. Okay, this is, you may have said this before, but using one criteria, taste, and taste alone, what is your favorite coffee brand or or retail coffee? Whatever your your top. Personally. Yes, personally. I like McDonald's coffee. Ah, <laughs> I, 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 it's, a, it's a good, solid, dependable blend. Yeah. I get a large one in the morning with four creams, four sugars, along with an empty cup on my way to work. And you know, it, it is reliable. It is good. You know, you can go anywhere. And it'll taste the same. It's quick. And you know, darn it, it tastes pretty good. I go to Starbucks, it's a little bit too strong for me sometimes. Okay. Or, you know, so. All right, uh, Jeff, you had a question. Yeah, I'd like to follow up your discussion here with Pat about revolutions. Okay. Um, why would you maintain that coffee is any more likely to produce revolution you talk about coffee houses, right? <clears throat> All right. Uh, why wouldn't a, a, a wiser thesis be that any place where any kind of stuff is served, especially where you're you know, obviously restaurants, mm -hmm. but where the coffee or booze or tea or whatever it is is served, where folks have a chance to sip something? and they're not stuffing their face, but they're just sipping and talking, why wouldn't those establishments, regardless of what they serve, be the hotbeds in principle, or in, at least in theory, of possible revolutionary discussion? I think I'm, in what you're telling me about, Jeff, I would be thinking that the behavior of the human beings in those places is exactly what went on in those coffee houses. And what I'm simply saying is that the social norms that have been around coffee and coffee drinking are those characteristics that you have described. I am not saying that there is a correlation between <coughs> and revolution. What I am saying is there's a correlation between and, and revolution. Okay. All right. I'm going to make myself clear. All right. Dennis. What? You had a question. Yeah, Tim, great presentation. What about certified shade grown coffee? Shade um, grown. You have just stumped me again. Why don't you come up and lighten us and tell us a little bit about it? We'll be discussing it in the rebuttal. Okay, okay, fine. I'm trying to put you on the spot. No, no, I, I, I just, I just, just said, all right. Yeah, and okay. I mean, you know, there, right. there are four types of, 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 of organically grown coffees. I didn't, again, the video would have addressed it, but it's just, it's just the sound, you know. And, and, and so you know, I, I really would right. like to know more. Okay. All right. Uh, now, uh, sir, you had a question. Yeah. Uh, back to this fair trade uh, deal where <clears throat> people get more money and better wages. So can you tell me what does a fair trade coffee picker in Brazil actually earn? <laughs> Again, I don't know. I do know, according to the CNBC documentary in uh, Peru, where they actually did a, you know, certify a farmer, they went from where the place the bean was picked and followed it all the way through to its final blend. That the farmer itself got about six thousand dollars a year in income, which to our standards is not much, but in an area like that, it, it can provide enough for not only his basic living expenses, but for the extras in life. That six thousand dollars. That's profit. profit. Okay, are you talking about individual farmers or plantations? I would be talking. I would be talking. In the particular example that was cited in the CNBC a documentary, it was a family-ran plantation of about five people. The family, his the the, the farmer. His wife, I think their son who was growing up, and then he had two hired workers that worked with him to help, you know, with the. So they did a thousand bucks a year? No, this was after expenses, Charlie. After paying his workers, 
after everything else, the farmer cleared about a $6,000 profit on his, his thing. Whereas if he was at normal coffee prices, he would have barely broken even. Is that That's, the typical uh, situation? Small um, scale farm, farm or large scale? Farm scale uh, That's the farmer, not the farm worker we're talking yeah. about. So, you know, again, uh, when you're working on a farm in an industrial on a plantation like that, a lot of it depends on what the guy's making and how cheap he is to put pay, or how, or how much he values his labor as mm -hmm. to what the wage prevailing wage rate is. All right, um, ma'am, did you have another question? I do. I, I and perhaps there'll be more than one answer on this. Okay. Yeah, you know, there's different people have different tastes, but I like to know the secret of making good coffee because mine always tastes terrible, and, <laughs> and I, I think it has something to do with. The accumulation of, of minerals or something. Um, like I, what, what type of coffee maker do you use? An automatic drip or a French press or just a coffee? The, uh, I guess you call it a drip. Well, I mean, okay. Yeah. The thing you want to do is run some vinegar through it about every six months to clear out the mineral taste. And then, you know, if, you, if, you, if it's really bad, take that like CLR cleaner and you run it, run it through it on uh, the boo cycle. But then make sure you run it, run clear hot water through the lines then at least five yeah. times after you use it. Um, you have to know that. But then the other thing you might want to do is are you putting in too much in or are you putting too little in in your in your blend? That has a lot to do with it. And how long are you keeping the coffee in the shop? You buy a ten pound bag, you let it sit for six months, or are you buying like a, a little bit at the supermarket and replenishing the stock every week? There is just so much that can go into making a good cup of coffee. The best place that I found, uh, if, you, if you go to the Coffee Growers Association webpage, they have got a lot of answers. But as far as automatic drips concerned, I usually can use like a couple, you know, two to three heaping scoopfuls in the thing, about 12 cups of water, and then uh, I use, if I, and I just use ordinary tap water, you know, and I just throw it in. And then, um, you know, I usually get a very powerful brew that's got a little bit of a kick to it, a little bit of a bitter taste. But then they use a little cream and sugar, and it usually turns out just fine. Uh, I wish there was a way for me to get rid of that bitter taste uh, that I have in my own personal automatic drip coffee, but I just haven't really taken the time to figure that part out yet. But I do know that it tastes a lot better when the drip coffee maker is cleaned out about every six months. And they recommend using vinegar. All right. Um, all right, Charlie, you had a question. Yeah, like, like the guy said back here, Starbucks got a gazillion dollars in business or whatever beyond everyone else combined. In the retail coffee. Well, how much do their employees get it in, if any? Charlie, I'm going to have to tell you about Starbucks that the only thing that I can really, to get, in order to give you a really good solid answer to your question, I'd have to really delve into the financials of Starbucks. I do know that the typical barista, from what my understanding is, is seven to eight dollars an hour. Oh, shit. Uh, some of them are a little bit better when they've been around for a while. And a lot of them the manager of the store because they got great latitude in how they can hire and a little bit about what the prevailing wage rate is. I know that the Starbucks at my hometown in Algonquin, they've had the same four people there for the last three or four years, and they don't turn over too much help. Then there's another one in Carpenter that's always bringing new people in. And I, it, it just is a reflection of the manager of the store in a lot of cases. But I mean, they're pulling in an enormous amount of money. That's how they do it. Yeah, that's how they do and it. And there's no return. <laughs> The, 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 the reason why businesses are made is to make money. Right. Now, I'm not going to say sit here and try to justify a low wage and a big fat capitalist making a, a, ki a killing on, you know, basically exploitation. But what I am going to say is that there is also no, I have no problem with a company making decent money when they're treating their people decently. Now, I do know that in mostly in retail, uh, that from what I remember at certain Starbucks deals, less people in Starbucks are covered by health insurance than in Walmart wow. as a percentage. They only pay enough benefits 
equal the cost to hire and retrain a new person. If it costs $1,000 to hire and retrain a new person, that's what you get in benefits. And in some, in it's some not because cynical, they found Jesus. In some <laughs> cynical ways, that makes a lot of sense when you're really just doing it. Like it I said, look, 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 look at what the major company, look at what the major coffee companies were doing in the 50s by cheapening their blend. Once the accountants take over, you don't have the quality anymore. Right. Um, any other problem? You had a question. Yes. Uh, I'd like to know what the relationship is between uh, Nestle's or Nescafe's coffee outfit or Nescafe's outfit. Yep. Yes. Oh, yeah, they are. Right. Yeah, Nescafe's owned by Nestle. Yes, and, and that's the only market of coffee that they're in is the instant form. I didn't really explore that much relationship, but I do know that as far as coffees are concerned around the world, that Nescafe uh, is, the, is the premier brand. You know, you go overseas, Middle East or Europe, most everybody, you know, drinks Nescafe versus some of the other more traditional coffee blends that we do in the U.S. All right. Um, any other questions? Anybody? Okay. Oh, sir, go ahead. Uh, I'm wondering, are any governmental entities involved in these uh, free trade combines? And my thinking is this, that uh, you know, I have a suspicion that there might be because uh, uh, the U.S. probably has a, a good interest in that these entrepreneurial farmers not making any money uh, making, uh, growing uh, coffee trees. Uh, will not switch over to sell cocaine or poppy seeds and you know narcotics and they can sell at a far higher price. So maybe the governmental bodies are involved in uh, you know stabilizing, uh, giving them attractive wages to keep them there. So right. to be honest, what would be the answer? If you know, I, I don't know. To be honest, okay. I don't know. Most of the certifications have been done on a voluntary basis and have been done by either companies or. Uh, you know, voluntary trade associations, from what my own limited knowledge is on the subject. Okay. But right. I think it's time we go to rebuttals now. Okay, uh, well, let, let me, we got a little bit of time left, and let me just ask if there's anybody who, anybody else who has a question. Okay, all right, uh, sir, go ahead. Is Starbucks a franchise, or is it just owned by one corporation? It's owned by, I believe it's just one corporation. And that the stores are basically owned by the corporation, because if you remember back in uh, in uh, the early 2000 period, you know, 2005, 2006, Starbucks had radically overexpanded, and they had no problem closing stores and laying people off. You wouldn't have that if you had a franchisable operation, nor would you have the near number of stores because <laughs> each one would have been a controlled territory. All right. Um, all right, sir, you, did you what have another sir, question? They're not offering a franchise. If you could uh, explain for us the business angle, what's the The business angle is this, okay? When you have a franchise, it's a quick way of getting your name out there, selling your business, and you're in partnership with a franchise. And versus owning the store, you know, that guy who's a franchisee is a businessman. He's going to have to abide by a contract with the parent company. But if you're the parent company and you own the store, you can basically say, hey, we can shut you down right away. We can expand right away. We don't have to go through a month, another middle guy to make things. The advantages are, like McDonald's and some of the Burger Kings and some of the other franchised operations, is that you get a lot of money up front because you're paying for a guy to come in and be dedicated to the name and the expansion of that business and a little bit of local community flavor on it much like Subway's been doing for many years. <coughs> or or you can be a, a major corporation. You never heard of a franchise Walmart store. That's the difference between franchising and not. Yeah, but my question went to what is the interest of Starbucks to keeping their present structure by not offering franchises? Because basically Starbucks is already making a lot of money with their stores. Okay, and it's just a franchising operation would, would, it would, it would be stupid for them to do it when they're making all the money in the stores anyway. They go in, they rent some space, they bring it in, they get the employee staff, they have running in about less than three months. 
versus you franchise something, you've got to make a financial commitment to the guy for 20 years. That's the difference. Less capital. <coughs> Less capital okay. in franchise. Right. Um, all right. Okay, any other questions? No? All right. Well, let's have another round of applause for Stephen. All right, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restore the microphone here. Sorry the video didn't work out as well yeah, as it yeah. showed. Okay, I'm going to work. All right, I'm going to restore the microphone here um, so that... Uh, now, now, Frank, before you get up and speak, I just want to get a little count here. Uh, would, by the way, Frank, would you mind? Uh, could you sit down? I am not doing anything. Just okay. go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, Frank here is... Um, all right, all right, all right. All right, now before before we get into the rebuttal period, uh, I would first like to uh, just get a, get a show of hands. Everybody who wants to speak, uh, raise your hand, please. Okay? Uh, I'm going I'm to count. Keep your hands up. Okay? Keep your hands up in the air. I'm going to count everybody. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And I'm going to add, um, I'm going to add our speaker as number 14. So four minutes each. Now I just want to say before we start. Um, so okay, but anyway, four minutes each. Go ahead, Frank. The, the main reason that I came to speak tonight was to tell you all that Tim has stumped me tonight. Uh, he has given one outstanding presentation and he has demonstrated a deep... Oh, he's not here? He has demonstrated a, a profound knowledge of his subject. He has studied with, with uh, a very, very uh, dedication. And then, when he didn't know something, he said, I don't know. Which is uh, a very, very scientific way of, of dealing with the subject. So we, we should uh, recognize that he has out, done an outstanding job. Also, I want to say that his presentation tonight have reminded me of another presentation in the past that it was as in-depth and the question and answer was as well uh, of an answer. And that was when Dennis Nelson gave the talk on nuclear power. He was outstanding also. Uh, it is very important for me to tell this to Tim because I've been a very harsh critic of his uh, uh, kind of willy-nilly way of answering about capitalism and the way it works and all that. And today he demonstrated that he had been thinking and, and developing his, your his yes. understanding that uh, demonstrated quite a bit of uh, intellectual uh, power. So thank you, Tim. Um, going to uh, being that I come from Argentina, South America, our coffee there was coming from Brazil. And when we Argentines moved into Chicago, the coffee to us tasted like umbrella juice. That's how we to have some umbrella juice today. It was, it was awful. And this is what the Americans were drinking, as he demonstrated in the, in the presentation. Uh, we were being uh, uh, you know, we were being taken, cheated, yeah. Um, so, uh, how do you use the coffee, the coffee grounds? Uh, in Argentina, we learned to use the coffee grounds for one very specific purpose, and that is to unplug the drains in your house, in your kitchen. And what happened is, the process is that like this, when you cook and throw oils and greases in the sink, these things start covering the, the pipes, and when you throw the dry coffee grounds, they stick to the grease, and then they swell absorbing the grease, and then eventually the water washes them out. So they keep the drains clean. So uh, that's how we do at home. We throw the grounds in the thing, and it's, it's, it works. Or, so far, it's not tested scientifically, 
but it has worked in my house for a long time. <laughs> and we do that in Argentina very often. So. Okay. <laughs> One of my favorite uh, subjects was broached this evening, and that's the Boston Tea Party. And uh, there's a misconception about the Boston Tea Party that it was the, the, the patriots of America who uh, raided the, the British ships and threw the tea overboard. Uh, the real story is that the British were bringing their tea from China, and American pirates were bringing tea from China. And the pirates were making a lot of money by selling just barely under the cost, under the price of the British. When the British removed all taxation from the tea, the American pirates were really upset. So they dressed as Indians, went out to the British ships, and threw the boxes of tea into the Boston Harbor. It had nothing to do with patriotism, but a lot to do with I'm not making any more money. Um, the subject of China was also raised during this evening's discussion, and uh, which brings me to the, the relationship between coffee and the uh, stimulus to go to work, to do harder work, to be bright and cheerful while you're working. Uh, in China, during the opium wars, another misconception, uh, the British had been selling opium in China for a long time. And there was a movement in China to get rid of the addiction of opium. The opium dens were uh, basically destroyed on an individual basis by groups of people who went around. Uh, the British started the opium wars in order to disband those groups of roving uh, opium den uh, destroyers, if you will. Um, the European and American uh, labor organizations are really at fault for not organizing the labor in the, in, in the, in the rest of the world. First of all, uh, we don't speak the languages where we can begin the organizing. Uh, how many of us speak Chinese? You know, it's, it's necessary for us, the labor movement, to go into these places and to, to do the organizing. If we don't do that, uh, it'll be a hundred years before the Chinese, the Indonesians, the Philippines actually begin to uh, achieve some of the benefits that we have achieved through our labor organizations. Uh, today on uh, NPR, there is the uh, program called, uh, called uh, This American Life. There was a, uh, a first-hand report by a writer on the Fox, uh, Foxcom, a, uh, the largest manufacturer of electronic equipment in China. It employs over 100,000 workers. And uh, they have dormitories in the, in the factory where the workers can go after their 12 or 14 or 15 hour shift. Uh, the rooms in which they are, are as was described, a 12 by 12 concrete cubicle and uh, with bunk beds, and the distance between the top of one bunk bed and the bottom of the next one was so small that an American could not fit into it. <laughs> there were small, thin Chinese children who were working in the, in the, at Foxconn, uh, beginning at the age of about 12 in the time. That's all I have to say. They got all the coffee they could drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a bit of uh, history. Back in the 17th century, no, it was the 18th century, my goodness, uh, John Wesley, uh, the leader of the Methodist movement, <coughs> found that one of the greatest problems was drunkenness and uh, alcohol. So he <coughs> told his people, those who abstained from it, and he abstained himself. 
but he had to ride around all over England and Wales and Scotland and Ireland. Really, uh, he traveled a lot on uh, horseback and he had uh, all sorts of medical paraphernalia with him. Because, um, one of the, the uh, ministries of a Christian is to tend to the sick. And people looked uh, to, to him for advice. He's written a book on uh, physics. Uh, healing. Uh, so, uh, but whenever he was being entertained by uh, people in the Methodist movement or uh, sympathizers, uh, they would not give him liquor to drink, so they had to give him something they gave him coffee or tea. Well, he drank a lot of coffee. Uh, you could have stopped, right? The frequent stops uh, to uh, get off his horse. Um, and it also gave him something of a buzz, and he didn't get that much sleep at night. Uh, so he began to think that perhaps this was a problem. An addiction, and he, uh, he thought perhaps he should cut down or abstain. Well, he tried cold turkey, and uh, for about three days he was completely out of it. You know, going cold turkey, no coffee, no tea. So he decided that perhaps this was a problem too, uh, not quite the problem of uh, alcohol, but it was a problem and uh, he warned people about overindulging in that revolutionary drink coffee. And thanks, Tim, for a great presentation. Well, I'm not really a coffee drinker myself. The first time I tried it was during my senior year of high school many, many years ago. Uh, it was after church. And I actually liked the milk and sugar I put into it rather than the coffee itself. But, you know, people can drink what they want to. I support fair trade coffee, not free trade coffee. I didn't mean to put Tim on the spot but with his knowledge of coffee. I was kind of surprised that he's never heard of certified shade-grown coffee. And that's something that I also... Uh, support the economic value of tropical forest to coffee production. Leaving some potential farmland as tropical forest can increase agricultural productivity. I looked up some scientific papers about this, in fact. One was entitled Economic Value of Tropical Forest to Coffee Production, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the USA, August 24, 2004. This is based upon work led by Dr. Taylor Ricketts, who's a director for the conservation science program of the World Wildlife Fund and preserving smaller patches of tropical forest right next to coffee farms in Costa Rica could increase both the size and quality of the coffee crops by providing the necessary habitat for pollinators. Coffee yields were increased by around 20 percent. Pollination reduced the frequency of what are called bee berries, uh, pea, I'm sorry, pea berries with a pea, pea berries the small deformed seeds by 27 percent. During 2000 to 2003, the pollination services from two tropical forest patches contributed around $61,716 in income each year for, for one large Costa Rican coffee farm. Now the dominant pollinators for coffee flowers include what are called non-native feral Africanized honeybees that can pack quite a sting, and then you had 10 native species of stingless bees. As the summary concludes, quote, conservation investments in human-dominated landscapes can therefore yield double benefits for biodiversity and agriculture. Similar results were reported in another study by researchers from the University of Göttingen in Germany and the University of Victoria in Canada. 
the economic evaluation of pollination services comparing coffee landscapes in Ecuador and Indonesia. Ecology and Society, Volume 11, Number 1, 2006. Now this article concludes, quote, producing certified organic coffee under complex shade could be a possible solution for coffee growers confronted with the impact of adjacent forest site destruction and falling coffee prices on the world market. However, only an elevated uh, consumer willingness to pay for biodiversity friendly coffee could generate substantial incentives for landowners to maintain their shade coffee production systems, thereby conserving ecological functions, which are of special importance in highly fragmented areas where only small patches of natural forest remain." Unquote. You've got these right-wing ultra-conservative uh, commentators like Rush Limbaugh and Ann Coulter, they're ecological ignoramuses, who get on the air and shoot their big mouths off about how the environmental wackos, yeah. that's Rush Limbaugh <laughs> talking about, you know, myself, Charlie, and others are saying, right. you environmentalists want to return the world to the way it was. You want something that's pristine. This is not pristine. A coffee plantation is not a pristine environment. It's a developed environment, but if it's not Tim. too intensively Sorry, developed, these are the sorts of things that can be done to um, improve um, uh, you know, biological diversity and increase coffee production. I also found something online about measuring and managing the environmental cost of coffee production in Latin America that, costs about the, that talks about the, the coffee husks. The drying process takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of electricity and firewood. And there's a cooperative, the Montes de Orlo Cooperative in Costa Rica, that's reducing these things by using, it's a combination hybrid system. It uses solar heat and biogasification. So you're using a solar heating and you're, you're taking the uh, coffee husks and you're turning them into a biogas and that's being used in the, the drying process that helps uh, you cut the energy use and the energy costs. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Very good. Very good. Uh, Tim's presentation uh, brought to mind a book that I read, A Force More Powerful by Ackerman and Duval. Uh, uh, Charles Paydock suggested the book, uh, and the two. Uh, this has to do with nonviolent resistance. And the two things they usually do in these situations is withdraw consent from the government. It's usually the government. They withdraw consent from the government or the institution. And the second thing they do is to replace the institution by providing the services. So, for instance, in Nashville, or, some, or I think it was in Nashville, uh, in the 60s, black people wanted to eat at the uh, lunch counter downtown. They would go in there and they weren't served. So uh, they refused to uh, cooperate by uh, going into the uh, lunch counter and um, flooding it with people until they had to close the, close the places down. So they were withdrawing consent. I'm not going to let you do this. The second thing they did was boycott the stores, replace their services, and went to uh, black entrepreneurs and uh, made deals with the black entrepreneurs so they couldn't raise prices. So they actually replaced the services until the uh, people in charge cooperated. Tim said basically the same thing we can do in the economic sector. The two things he said is withdrawn consent. It was obvious that he said, hey, if you're not satisfied with what you get, you don't have to go there. The second thing is you can replace the service. You, the way you do that is go to fi fair trade. None of this is easy. It takes a lot of organizing. But the point is we don't have to let these predatory, irresponsible, vicious, uh, un uh, capitalists basically yeah, get away yeah, with this right. stuff, we can make them do the right thing. It takes a lot of hard work, but it can be done. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Hello, my name's Rhonda. Can you hear me? Yeah. No. Don't yes, we can. Don't use stupid thing and speak loud. Okay. I'll just yell. Um, so I want to talk about the beverage that changed the world.
old, I guess, is how you're, what we're, we're kind of all talking about. Is it really coffee or what? Uh, Karina and I went, she's left the room, and Ellen's left the room, and I'm going to talk about, try to answer her question, too. But um, Karina and I went to the Peter Museum for the chocolate uh, exhibit, which ends tomorrow. And we saw the cacao bean, and uh, there was a picture of beans flowing. And I think on this video, there was a picture of beans flowing. So it feels really very similar to me. There was uh, something that astounded Karina, which was that there were chocolate houses, hot ch really sort of hot chocolate before there were coffee houses. And they were also fomenting yes, revolution. So uh, I don't know how to pursue that, but I think it's probably worth pursuing. Uh, why did coffee take over from chocolate, etc.? cetera? Um, as far as tea goes, it, it, if you take a, a history class when you're in college, you'll have a professor who will say that coffee became popular in the US because of the Boston Tea Party, because we dumped the tea. Whether it was whether it was patriotic or not, it still managed to uh, to change the habits of Americans. Uh, Alan has come back in the room. So um, about the health benefits of coffee, I am not aware of it being positive in terms of strokes. I'm really not sure about that part. In fact, I thought it was bad for the heart. There may be new studies, but I, I did hear of a new study that said that for diabetes, if you drink three or four cups a day, and you have to drink at least three or four cups per day, it does reduce the diabetes, which, as this lady um, mentioned, uh, You mean the risk, the risk of developing diabetes? Or? Yes. yes. It, it, it reduces your, your, the possibility of your developing diabetes. And as this woman explained how it worked in terms of the insulin, I don't really understand it either, but that's my understanding. That was coffee. And uh, finally, I want to talk about Starbucks. Uh, again, the same kind of issue that we've been, uh, that this gentleman in the back has been talking about. Uh, what is it? They've done a poll. And they've asked people, what's your favorite coffee? And Dunkin' Donuts and McDonald's rate higher than Starbucks and Gloria Jeans and all of those. And what what is it that keeps people coming back to Starbucks? Is it just hype? What, what is it? And the other thing about Starbucks is that they do have other items. In the 90s, there was there's a Starbucks that's in Hyde Park that I went into, and I couldn't stand it. Everything you bought in there smelled like, tasted like chocolate, even if it wasn't a chocolate thing. Now, they have overpriced egg salad sandwiches, and they have overpriced juice, and they have overpriced cookies, and so there's something uh, about their marketing that appeals to people, whatever it is. Thank you. Okay, well, this is obviously a night of facts, which is fine. Uh, just an interesting side to uh, religious interpretations of caffeine. The Mormons forbid, uh, Joseph Smith forbid the uh, drinking of coffee as, or tea as well as alcohol. And so Mormons who are um, adhering to their faith uh, don't drink coffee and tea. And some by extension don't drink caffeinated sodas, although others do because he didn't mention Coca-Cola specifically since it wasn't around when he was. Um, uh, when I was uh, a teenager um, in, this, in the mid-60s, um, coffee was a habituation because um, people didn't want to call it an addiction. But in fact, later on, caffeine was, uh, people became, or it was defined as an addiction to caffeine because just like any other drug that you become addicted to, it qualifies because you need increasing doses Sorry, to maintain Kim. the same level, to make, have the same effects. <coughs> and when you stop it, you get side effects. And people get headaches and things like that when they stop drinking caffeine. If they're used to drinking caffeinated beverages, they, they get 
with these withdrawal symptoms. And um, I was wondering to see a, a number of studies about caffeine, and I don't pay attention to a lot of them, but the one that I paid attention to was it reduced the onset of dementia in women with coffee. So I'm right there. <laughs> Uh, I want to uh, first off uh, join with uh, several other speakers uh, commending uh, Tim on a uh, very, very good, well-informed, well-researched uh, presentation. I also want to share uh, the pleasant surprise that your almost Pauline conversion uh, that, uh, you know, capitalism, well, potentially constructive, has its pitfalls, which uh, you yourself, you gave us weapons in how to deal with its excesses. And sometimes that is more than we have heard here from some of the most rabid Marxists uh, who have ranted away at the capitalist system, uh, but offered no solutions for dealing with it. And uh, you touched on that tonight, and for that, I think we should all thank you. Uh, uh, you talked, of course, about uh, coffee being one of the fuels of revolution. What a lot of people don't realize, and I touched on it, and I wasn't being entirely facetious, our founding fathers were not completely sober. <laughs> when they met in Independence Hall. How could they be? Nobody drank water in those days. Because, because there were very good reasons. You know, it, water was potentially lethal. Water caused a number of diseases in those days. So people people drank yes, coffee and tea, but more often, more often, uh, they drank uh, hard cider, they drank wine, they drank beer. Even the Purit Puritans, a uh, hundred years before that time, who, you know, by reputation at least, couldn't quite forgive God for inventing fun, and were very much against premarital sex because it might lead to dancing. Uh, even these people drank their fill uh, a beer. Um, so, you know, look, put yourself in Independence Hall in July 1776. A firebrand by the name of Tom Jefferson gets up and says, let us break away by force from the mightiest empire the world has seen since the Romans. Let's be prepared to fight them. Now, sober men <laughs> on hearing that, are going to calculate the cost. <laughs> These guys didn't. They said, yeah, let's go. <laughs> I mean, it was like John Wayne and Ernest Hemingway on steroids. Uh, the truth of the matter is that, you know, yeah, uh, it wasn't until the 1830s or 40s that America got over what was, and I'm, I'm quite serious, America had a major drinking problem. It, it, it really did, because other options were not available. Coke wasn't invented until the 1870s or 1880s. Uh, you know, other other soft drinks uh, were not invented until much, much later. Uh, root beer was just in its infancy, and uh, so people needed to drink something. If you drank water, you were going to get cholera. You know, remember, a fifth of the population of Chicago in a two-year period in the 1880s died of cholera from bad water. Uh, this was no joke, so what did you do? You found distilled spirits, you found brewed spirits, you did what you could, but you went through life, in some cases, in a buzz. Was that a bad thing? It gave us our freedom. Thank you. <laughs> I was waiting for Tim to get back in here because he needs to hear my my appraisal. I was going to come up and say, well, not for the grammarian's report, which is a part of our Toastmasters meeting, I'm sure Tim recognizes. 
Mm -hmm. Interesting topic, Tim. I know you know it well. I, um, I recall a friend of yours saying, well, why don't we test things out to make sure everything's working properly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much preparation you put into the actual speaking parts. I feel you could have done better. <coughs> too many ums, way too many you knows, mm -hmm. which I know you're better than doing because I've seen you do much, much better. Mm -hmm. As for the sound, so you know, the sound, Tim thought I was bringing speakers because I was, we were going to use my laptop. <coughs> When Tim said he was going to bring his computer, he said, I bring everything with my computer, and I thought he meant the speakers, too, so the speakers got forgotten at home. A miscommunication, it shouldn't have happened. We brought an extra projector, we brought an extra screen, we didn't think, think to check on speakers. <coughs> Overall, an interesting topic. One I'm not too familiar with. I, I think I tried coffee once and I couldn't put enough sugar or anything in it to make it down. My, my poison is Mountain Dew, which is probably worse than coffee. It rots your guts faster, gives you more caffeine. And it would be so all of mice. Mice. So, I remember I, I drank a quart of Mountain Dew full strength Mountain Dew one time and I got the shakes from it. Whoa. So, it's good stuff. <laughs> I can't say too much bad about Tim because I want I don't want to have to walk home. <laughs> but Tim, great subject. I know you worked on it a lot. It's too bad the videos didn't work out because I've seen some of those videos before. They're excellent videos. And Tim knows the subject. He's spoken on it before. Maybe he can do a part two sometime and we'll have it more ready for everybody. Alright, I got a little time here. That's good. Completely off. Anyhow, alright. Thanks, Tim. Let's see. I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. Um, I came across a figure when I spoke in evolution of how many plants there are and how many have been used at one time or another as a food or beverage and how many it's only like about 135 who have been grown commercially and we're down to five or six. Uh, the fact that they didn't know anything about coffee until the sixth century to me was a little surprising. Uh, yeah. I think it had been around if you go back a little further, but it's no big deal. Uh, thinking about coffee, uh, yeah, the government in the United States is just not long ago signed, if you like, free trade agreements regarding Central America and South America, uh, completing NAFTA. Uh, I don't think that thinking about it reflectively now that that was such a good idea. I don't think the United States should be gain in cutthroat colonialism. And I certainly don't want to buy stuff grown by conquistadors. It just seems to be the case here. Uh, there's no indication, it, 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 apparently every indication that these things aren't grown in the proper fashion. Uh, and I find it inconceivable that a guy, given the price, coffee is quite expensive, and certainly expensive in a Starbucks. <laughs> and it doesn't, doesn't seem to be, or it wasn't convinced to me, that the growers are getting anything more than a few pennies. Mm -hmm. And the people who are selling your Starbucks coffee are getting nothing but a few pennies. That's an outrageous figures. That one chart there, where they're bringing in unquestionable amounts of wealth. And where is it going? I, there's no return from those sales figures back to the people that brew the coffee and the people that grow it and the people that process it and carry it in sacks. That's just inconceivable. Uh, 
Kath says, well, I got a solution. I can boycott. Boycott everything free market capitalism produces. No, I, that's just what I've got to do right now. I can't buy anything in a store because it's most likely made by children. I don't think I can have any beverages. <laughs> so, I don't know. Well, I, if that's quite the solution, then I have to restrict myself in that fashion what in order to consume you only things. You know, I think, yeah, there's something wrong with the system. <coughs> and I think it's going to take a lot more than a few of us, no matter, like you said, is it hard? Why is it so hard? Because there's money to be made and the guys don't want to stop making fucking money, that's why. And they don't make it easy. And I think there's another thing you're talking about here. You're talking about going to an association site. Please, okay, you guys were, we were arguing about information on the internet. Now what kind of valid information are you going to get from an association site on that product? Go to the lumber. Well, we're talking about lumber. Yeah, you're a lumberjack. Where's the lumberjack guy? Go to the American Lumber Association <laughs> and see if you're going to get any real information regarding the lumber industry in the United States and the world. If you want to have some real entertainment, go to the coal industry. <laughs> and to top them all, go to the American Petroleum Institute. <laughs> now, that will tell you why there's more no validity in the occasion to this stuff that comes out on the internet, and I would really question it. All right, I'm going to change a little bit here. <coughs> the last thing I'm going to talk about, I've had a sudden interest, not a real sudden interest, but a, it's growing and it's still growing in, in the... Uh, the American Revolution. I've always had an interest in it. My little factoid, if you like, on the Tea Party was, um, well, first of all, I don't know if they were pirates necessarily. John Hancock was the biggest importer. <laughs> and uh, he was, in fact, just about the wealthiest guy in town as well. I don't know if he... He's, too happy being called a pirate. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the term now. This case, smuggler. 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 Yeah, and the idea from the story that I get was was that the British put an end to smuggling, and he, in fact, was was on trial for it. He was never really convicted. Who knows what happened? And we'll ever know. But he was. Uh, arrested for smuggling, and the British and the Tea Party. My understanding was, was that they were going to they were putting an end to it. And I know it gets on the British. The Bostons will, will, will tell you a different story, but nevertheless, they said enough of the smuggling. You're going to buy our tea and you're going to pay your tax. Now the other facet of the thing was the tax. Now from what I can know, and I don't know. You could do the figures and do the whatever. But from what I've been told was that the average resident of, of Boston would have to drink several thousand gallons of tea per year to maybe come up with like 10 cents in tax. It was just the most minuscule uh, value added type tax that you could find. And this is what also befuddled Parliament, because they said, well, geez, we have an enormous debt, and we are putting a tax on them, but geez, guys, you know, this is like, this is no tax at all. It's certainly nothing that, you know, that's what I mean. It, it was very minuscule in that regard. But yeah. anyhow, I gave us plenty to talk about here, and I think I'll look into the topic a little bit further. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank, uh, thanks, Tim, for uh, excellent uh, uh, idea of a presentation. <laughs> yeah, the the audio thing is too bad that kind of uh, you know caused the problems. I would have liked to have heard the uh, the, uh, the the audio, the video uh, better. 
But uh, anyway, uh, one benefit of this topic for me tonight was to uh, uh, arose my interest in studying more about the Boston Tea Party. So I'm going to have to, or the, the, uh, the Boston Tea Institute. Uh, I, guess they, I guess they call it the Boston Tea Party. Yes, they yes. do. Yes. 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 That's right. Um, and from what I've read about it, like on, on Wikipedia and stuff, uh, you know, really short on book length stuff, um, it wasn't just the, the smugglers issue, but it was it was a few other things as well played into it. And uh, in, a, in a nutshell, you know, the East India Tea Company was granted a monopoly on tea to America, and Parliament reduced the tax that they were charging the East India Tea Company to bring, the way it used to work, East India Tea Company had to bring tea to Britain, and then from, then from Britain, uh, wholesalers then could sell it to the colonies. And but there was a, but Britain put a 25% tax on the tea when it came from the East India Company, and that of course drove up uh, the price and increased smuggling from, from the Netherlands. Uh, you know, because Dutch tea had no taxes on it, so uh, so the East India Company protested. Parliament removed the tax, the 25% tax. But in order to make up the revenues, they said, "Well, we're going we're to tax the colonists," and they didn't like the idea that Parliament could put a tax on us because, in, in England anyway, only your rep only your elected representatives could impose a tax on you. And Parliament was not our elected res representatives, you know. So that, therefore, the, you know, this slogan, no taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. So even though, with the, even though with the tea tax on the colonists, the tea was still cheaper, actually, than, you know, the legally imported British tea with the tax was still tea cheaper than the Dutch tea. And or the, with the, the smugglers are bringing in, the colonial, colonial smugglers. So there were some smugglers that were going to have some, some problems. But, but overall, though, this idea spread, this idea that you know, we did not like being taxed. Uh, and then we were afraid that you know, the, this monopoly was granted to the East India <coughs> Tea Company. Now, they were now allowed to sell it directly to the colonists instead of having to go through the middleman. Uh, they were also worried that this would spread to other products. And uh, so that's sort of what set everybody off. I think that the major thing was this, this idea that, that we did not elect Parliament, and therefore uh, we should not have to you know, pay taxes that, that they impose on us. Now, uh, I guess I'll say that I come back to the modern, back to modern times. How much time do I have? Um, about half a minute. OK. Uh, I love Starbucks <laughs> coffee. For a while, I wouldn't drink it. I used to, you know, toe the liberal line and stay away from them because they were, you know, supposedly unfair labor and all this and that. That's before I had, you know, before I had the, uh, you know, the fog, you know, burned away by going to the Henry George School, learning about economics, learning about labor. Okay, everybody that's working in Starbucks, you know, is free to go somewhere else or start their own company. Their own coffee company. Uh, you know, they were the killers, so, uh, And I know, I, the other day I was in there, I bought, a, I bought a cup of tea, actually, and it was $2.16 for a medium tea. And I gave the lady $3. I told her to keep the change. And so even though they're always whining about the low wages at Starbucks, I see a lot of people giving change like that and throwing in a buck or, you know, whatever their change is. And in the downtown stores, anyway, I think they can earn some decent money in tips. So I don't know. They might only make seven or eight dollars an hour in uh, wages. But I, what does anybody, Tim? What what are their tips? Do anybody know what they, what they might work out to be? No, I, I didn't real, and I, I don't know if there was tipping allowed in the store. They, they, they have a tip. Okay, I can answer that. They have a. I don't know the exact amount, but uh, a lot of Starbucks stores you'll see at the counter a tip jar, which people may or may not put money in. And the office labeled tips, and you see, you know, it's a glass jar with a little hole in the top, big one to, into which people either stick change or, or dollar bills or what have you. Uh, some do, some don't. It's not as regular as at a sit-down restaurant like this. Um, uh, I can tell you this: when there is tipping in in a restaurant, or uh, or I don't know about a place like Starbucks, I think they need seven to eight an hour there. But in a restaurant like this, tipping 
uh, becomes an excuse for the employer to pay less than the minimum wage on, on the argument that it will be made up in tips. Uh, there's very little tipping in Western Europe uh, where, uh, where the restaurant staff are paid more money per hour. And I, know, and I know in the mornings when I, I walk past the Starbucks on Jackson and Wabash, usually I have my own coffee with me. I make my own Starbucks at home in a drip pot and I put it in my thermos and I take it with me. I drink it on the train. I drink it when I'm at work. But sometimes I, I forget it or I run out of coffee and I'd like to stop at Starbucks to get a coffee. But it, it's so busy that I, you know, I don't want to go there. I don't want to stand in line that long. So I mean, there, and uh, the, the rule of thumb that I heard uh, years ago was from the guy who started Starbucks. He said that people would rather pay two dollars for a good cup of coffee than a dollar for a shitty, shitty cup of okay. coffee. Okay, that's um, actually and, uh, so time's about out. Now. So, okay. okay, thanks, Tim. See you next week. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna give that in. Well, <laughs> First of all, some can't keep. With regard to Bob's comments, I will simply say how the mighty have fallen. What's that? <laughs> how the mighty have fallen. <laughs> okay. Um, with regard to what Patrick said about the consumption of alcoholic beverages during colonial times, essentially that's true, except he left out one beverage, rum. Yeah. And anyone who has seen the music of 1776 will recall that during the show, Stephen Hopkins, the delegate of Rhode Island, is noted for his consumption of rum. And yes, he appears frequently in the show as a character. Um, I think most people also will recall, or oh yes, and the subject of Nestle came up, and whether or not Nescafe is a Nestle product. Oh yes, it is. It has been from the beginning, plus Nestle is also well known for the production of its freeze-dried coffee, Taster's Choice. Um, with regard to the subject of rebellions, and does coffee fuel that? One rebellion got left out. This was in 1974 at City Hall when we had the so-called Coffee Rebellion, as many of you will remember which Eddie Verdoli had, uh, which had somewhat mixed results for the Verdoli for Verdoli and the people. Uh, Mayor Daly, the elder Mayor Daly, was not somebody who pushed around. And, um, oh yes, my, I'm not a coffee drinker. My mother was, and for whatever it's worth, she drank a, uh, a brand that not, was not talked about here tonight, and that was Stewart's Private Blend. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, we got we got, a, we got extra time, but uh, I'll tell you what. If, is any, does, does anybody else want to give a rebuttal? Yeah, I think. Oh, go ahead. Please. See if I can't fix it. Hang on, guys. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, the whole purpose of the mic was some people, some people got a stronger voice than others. Hang on. Yes, it definitely isn't working, bro. Well, hello. Yes, it's 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 it's. it's, it's that was working, Don. It's just that you have to put okay, it into. I'm your just talking. I'm building on what Charlie said about the proportion of profits that go to to the actual workers. And the Starbucks situation or coffee situation can be generalized to any number of, of uh, corporations, industries, and I believe it accounts for the declining uh, income of the masses of people. And uh, and what uh, is even more aggravating is when. It's, it's argued that uh, there is no money left for social services when all the money has been drained out by the uh, corporations and the super rich. And then, then they uh, act like, well, uh, you can't get anything more out of the economy. But uh, the fact of the matter is when uh, somebody is getting like, these corporations money, it's coming out of somebody's pocket. And that 
pocket is the masses of people. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Um, anybody else want to give a rebuttal speech? We got. Uh, well, let me think about this. Uh, we got a little time, so we could have another rebuttal speech if somebody else wants to give a rebuttal speech. Nope. All right. Well, in that case, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and give a rebuttal speech. Let me just set the mic down over here. Uh, looks like our microphone is working again. I don't really, I don't really need a microphone very much because. Um, because actually, I got a pretty strong voice, so I can actually just, you know, do the whole Joe Walsh thing. If any of you are familiar with Joe Walsh, walk around the restaurant with my coffee cup, you know, a cup of Joe. Joe, called Joe Walsh is a, is a crazy, he's a crazy congressman from the northern suburbs. And, and uh, anyway, oh, you know about him, right, Rob? Gene, okay. And so anyway, I got my coffee cup, like, like Joe Walsh, I got my coffee cup right here. So... I think probably the part of the problem with old Joe is that he drinks too much of it. Uh, if you ever seen him on, you should go go to YouTube and look up Joe Walsh. You're gonna you, you get a kick out of what you see there. I had um, he gets he he kind of he he comes comes on stage in a place like this what? restaurant. He gives speeches and I've invited him and his followers to come down to the College of Complexes because. Uh, he's a, actually a Tea Party member, and, uh, and 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 he just he gets up there and he just goes he just goes crazy. He just you know anyway. Enough about Joe Joe Walsh. Um, now, you know obviously coffee's had a big impact um, on our civilization, as as Tim's um, presentation points out. I mean, right across the, we're talking about why Starbucks makes so much money. Well, their lights out, but right across the street here, if their light were still on, you would be able to see through that window. A, a Starbucks, the, the picture of the benign mermaid there in the window. It's uh, uh, now, I mean, they're all over the place, you know. Um, and so, uh, so it's no wonder. Now, uh, now I, uh, Paul uh, gave some constructive criticism of Tim's presentation. I think uh, Tim's not here right at the moment, uh, but maybe Paul, Paul, I see you're here, so maybe you can you can transfer. Uh, what I'm going to say to Tim, I'm sure Tim, Tim won't mind me giving a little constructive criticism. You see, I'm like Tim, I'm I, and Paul. I've been involved in Toastmasters in the past. Uh, it's very good if you want to improve your skills in public speaking. Although I don't think anybody, any of the people who come up and give speeches here, really need to do that. But it, anyway, it is good for learning how to, you know, how to construct a lecture and, and, and give a speech and that kind of thing. Uh, I one thing now now. Paul already touched on and explained the audio problems, which, which was unfortunate, but uh, so I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, I do want to suggest uh, a way to improve, other than through bringing better audio equipment. Um, one thing you can do is, by, first of all, one of the problems is when you have a lot of technology, the more technology you bring into something, the greater the potential for some kind of electronic or mechanical breakdown. All right? I mean, this is a reason why I don't use a personal data assistant. I just use one of these. Because these things don't require batteries. And um, now, now, Karina, she's not here. She's chided me for my um, for my pre-industrial ways, uh, and and uh, and, but I don't have I don't have to worry about running out of batteries on certain things. So, what if your pen runs out of ink? Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, that's why I carry a pencil around. What if the pencil breaks? All right. What if? What if? What if uh, Paul, what if you observed the one fool at a time rule as, as much as everybody else here is doing? All right. Now. All right. Now. This, so this is what I wanted to get to. I felt like now we watched a lot of programs. I actually had seen the coffee program on the History Channel before, at least part of it. And um, this is interesting as far as it goes, but. In my experience, people get a lot more revved up by a, an exciting lecture than they do by just watching TV. And, you know, I, I personally tend to associate TV with falling asleep. And you know, you sit, you come home from work, you sit down, you turn the TV on, and you veg out. And and uh, you know, 
So a better idea, I mean, it's okay to use a TV show for source material if the information on it is good. Um, but a better idea is to take the source material, whether written or from TV or whatever, and, and kind of, kind of, um, and kind of combine it. Oh, there you are, Tim. Kind of combine it into a lecture. Take, you know, this is what, you know, that's, that's what you do when you write a, when, when, when somebody writes a paper in college or, or whatever, you, you take your source materials, you don't, you don't bring all the books with you and just read out of them verbatim. You, you take it, you condense it, combine it into a lecture, you could distribute written materials that will cite your sources if you want to. You know, there's no reason why you even have to do that. But that way you have a lecture that, that it, it, it flows together good. You combine all the information into one thing. And uh, you, know, you can use that TV program as a source. You see what I'm saying? And then kind of, and, and, but, but you have a lecture. And if all you got is lecture notes, you don't have to worry about some kind of mechanical breakdown. You got your notes and yourself, and that's all you need. Uh, very simple. So there's, there's far less potential for things to go wrong. Um, now, uh, just one other thing. I, I wanted to talk about some of the comments that I've heard tonight. Uh, Joe, you mentioned the opium wars. Uh, now, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, Britain went to war with China in the 1840s, the so-called opium wars, and the purpose uh, was actually to defend the uh, drug pushers in, uh, working in China. Uh, now, uh, I'll explain. Are you timing me, Brom? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, look, why, don't we, why don't we go off a little bit, if, if it's okay. Is it okay if, if I go on? The last no. speaker's going to be no. Tim. No. 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 Sure. Okay, so it was, it was Tim? All right, all right. Next two or three minutes. All right. Uh, the Opium War is, um, what happened in the, in the Opium War is that uh, some British merchants uh, were, were taking uh, opium that was made, opium is made from these flowers called poppies, and they would process it into opium, which is highly addictive, and then they would sell it in China. And they were making a lot of money from this, but the Chinese government didn't like these guys operating in their country, and they banned opium uh, and, and tried to suppress the drug trade. And while well, these British merchants, you know, they felt like they had the right to make money. I mean, it's free, this is, you know, free market economics and all that. And, uh, and they felt it was just horribly unfair that they shouldn't be allowed to sell narcotics in China. And so they got the British government to take their side and go to war with China on behalf of their right to sell dope. Now, Britain won and China lost. And so... Um, this would be the equivalent of, let's say, if Mexico went to war with the United States uh, over the right of the, um, of, the, of the narco traffickers to sell marijuana and coke in this country. Okay, now I'm going to, um, uh, let's see, how am I doing? Okay. come to that. All right, the only other thing is, so there's something, Charlie made some criticism of, of capitalism. Um, I think, you know, I think that that's, there's, Part of the problem, and Tim actually even did, I think part of the problem is that if, is the nature of corporations themselves. I don't think a, a guy that runs, let's say, the Lincoln Restaurant or the Cartland Cafe can just have a steady income, same amount of money year after year, and he might be satisfied with that. No problem. Anyway, it's his business, up to him. But if you're running a corporation, I'm going to put aside the crooked guys like Enron. If you're running a corporation honestly, you have a duty to see to it that you make more money every year. More, more of that next year than this year, and more than next year after that, because the stockholders, the people who buy stock, expect a return on their investment, and that requires in, infinite growth. Therefore, therefore, you have you, if, if you're running a corporation, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing according to their rules, you have to keep lowering the costs and, re, incre and, and increasing revenue, and and that's going to naturally lead. <coughs> to a tendency to try and cut corners, to try and start exploiting the workers and squeeze more, squeeze more work out of them, try and get the cheaper labor force. It's, it's, uh, now, so, now I want to just say, and actually a lot, of, a lot of other stuff, well, anyway, I also just wanted to say that overall I thought it was a, a, good, you know, a good presentation and I think my time's about up, so I'm going to yeah. yield the floor to Tim. All right. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank everybody for their comments on the speech itself tonight. And uh, 
Let me explain a little bit about my own self-evaluation of it. Although the material was interesting and it was there, I did notice you guys falling asleep on the video because it was there. My decision to use it in the first place was because when I initially wrote the speech, it was well over three hours when I went through it the first time. And I thought, okay, maybe the video can explain it better in a shorter amount of time than I could. It did a good job, but because the speaker problem was there, it didn't really work. So, about midway through the speech, that's why I started, uh, you know, picking up the fact that you guys would rather have me interactive, lecturing a little bit more, covering high points, and getting back to the basics of speech writing. And there was a lot of winging it tonight because I had to go back to that interactive method with it. Paul is right. I have done a lot better job. And had this been, had I just cut my material and then maybe not tried to cover so much, it would have been much, much better. But again, I did try to experiment. Some of it worked, some of it did not. And I hope that it was a good enough overall presentation for you guys tonight. I appreciate the comments. I appreciate the active criticism. And what Paul and the type of evaluation he gave this? tonight, and especially um, Can I take this? Don, too, are what typically goes on and what one of my postmasters And the speech was not one of my better efforts. It did give me the I disagree. It was a fine speech. It, well, I've been to Tim's Toastmasters lectures, okay? And so is Paul. So, but go on. It, it, you know, as far as my own thing, it wasn't one of my better ideas. What is the nice thing about it, though, is I've reached a level, at least, that I can give a good presentation, even though something has gone wrong. Uh, as far as the material itself with coffee, I, it was just a, a, a lot of learning for me. I'm going to give you this little story about how I became interested in the first place. If we go back to about 1998, and I had been employed with this company called Ubig.com for about maybe five months at the time, and I had no home internet access at the time, and I, for the first time, my brother gave me what we call the web TV. And my first weekend, it was kind of an easy to have, you know, I was on the web, looking around, and searching, and doing all this neat stuff, and on a particular Sunday night, I sat back and watched a program called uh, Book Notes on C-SPAN 2 at the time. And there was a particular guest by the name of Mark Pendergrass who wrote a book called A History of Coffee. I'm sorry, it was called Uncommon Grounds, A History of Coffee and Its Impact Upon the World. Well, I figured, yeah, you know, what the heck, I might as well see what's about it. Next thing you know, I'm on the web. Next thing you know, I'm at Amazon.com. Next thing you know, I'm working on a... Uh, Next thing you know, I ordered the book. Next thing, there's $22 out of my pocket. I said, this is too damn easy. But what it told me after I got the book and after several readings, literally twice through, it per percolated the interest in coffee. And my reason for trying a little bit of a different topic tonight at the college was I wanted to be a little bit challenged at the time. I think we did a good job. I mean, we have a lot of political stuff here. We have a lot of different things, but nothing where we just talk about coffee. I mean, most of the time for me, it's all capitalism, all the time, all economics, all this type of stuff. But I think the one thing that really kind of shocked me was how the price just went down so much over the last 15, 20 years that they were getting as much money on a proactive basis adjusted for inflation than they were 100 years earlier. It seemed to me, this is what this capitalist system kind of brings. And then I'm looking at it more and more, and I said, no, it's mercantilism. And it's exactly what Adam Smith was railing against. A few people controlling a commodity or trade that doesn't work. And a lot of times what we have to really take a look at is, are we really railing against capitalism, or is it mercantilism that we're really against? Is it because that we have true competition, or is it because there's a few players at the top who are involuntarily controlling the markets and just basically they'll take advantage of people because they can? 
Well, if there's a few crooks. Well, 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 let, let, let Jim speak. And Charlie. Well, you know, if there's a few crooks. Come on. Now, I'm not going to say that people are there because I do know that sometimes even your best friends, uh, given a chance, will tend to take advantage of you sometimes if they're allowed to get away with it. But at other times, too, sometimes your other best friends will have a sense of fairness. I, I'm, I'm stuck in a quandary. I think the system works very well of producing goods and services and, and gives people a chance to move around and, and gives people a way to do it. But at the same time, there are a lot of bad things that happen. And I have, I'm having more trouble reconciling the two right now than I used to. I used to think that it was all free markets, it'll cure itself, you know, all it needs a little rise in wages. But this time it kind of thought to me, you know, there really wasn't a solution to the problem. I mean, the coffee farmer does need to make a living. And yet, at the same time, there's huge, huge profits being made by certain industries. And particularly when I heard about the coffee in the 50s, the degrading of the beans, just to make another dime. And you know what happened? Coffee consumption went down on a per capita basis, giving the rise to other beverages. And all in all, <coughs> You know, the competitive model worked in some sense, and in another sense, it doesn't. But it all boils down to the one thing. How do you treat your workers? How do you treat your fellow human beings? If you're a corporation of that size, fulfilling a legitimate market need, there's also obligations that come with it. And if you're not honoring those obligations, you should be called to account for it. And in a lot of cases, if there's fraud, be prosecuted. I, again, Thank you for the privilege of letting me speak tonight. I hope it was an enjoyable speech, and I hope to do it again sometime soon. Thank you, Charlie, for letting me get on So, what you think? One second, folks. Uh, Bob Lichtenberg is going in for heart surgery Monday at St. Joseph's, so maybe on Tuesday or Wednesday, I give him a call. Or something. He's having a valve repair in his heart. Monday, yeah, St. Joseph's Hospital. Yeah, heart trouble. Yeah, heart trouble. Yeah.